Good afternoon. If I may have your attention, please, I think we are ready to start. Thank you. I am Esther Harrington, and I am the Public Service Desk Department Head at the Auburn Area Branch Library, which is part of the Bay County Library System. And I'm honored to welcome you on its behalf to this opening presentation of the 2015 Fall Session of Book for Lunch. As many of you will know, Tom Birch retired as director of the Bay County Library System early this year, and we welcome a new director last summer. We are very fortunate to have our new director, Trish Burns, in attendance to today's presentation, and I would like to invite her to say a few words to our audience to introduce herself. Please welcome Trish Burns. Good afternoon. It is so nice to be in front of a group of library supporters. Thank you so much for being here. Um, as Esther said, my name is Trish Burns, and I am the new library director for the Bay County Library System. I've been on the job for about four months now. I am what I consider a local at this point. I've lived in Linwood for about 30 years with my husband, and I have a 13, almost 14-year-old son who goes to Bay City Western. And I'm just terribly pleased to be here at the helm of the Bay County Library System. We have wonderful staff, we have wonderful patrons, great programs, and I look very forward to many years here and enjoying all of your company and everything that we have to offer for the community. So thank you very much for coming today and enjoy. All right. So the Bay County Library System is a member of the a la carte group which is a collaborative of nonprofit organizations in Bay City. And I'm very excited about this. The Delta College Planetarium is one of the members of this organization and is offering a very special program this weekend. On Sunday, September 27th, uh, Delta College Planetarium is opening uh, its facilities to the public for a free viewing of the total lunar eclipse. It's going to be at 9 p.m. and it's going to be on the rooftop, but they have a plan B if there is cloudy. <laughs> they, they can bring people indoors and they are going to have live feed on the computers from other locations and we have a clear sky. <laughs> so you will have the opportunity of seeing this occurrence, which is very special because it is uh, it's a, it's a full moon, it is um, a um, super moon, and it is also. Uh, a harvest moon. So we are not going to have the opportunity to see this again, I, I understand, until 2033. So I'm very excited to taking this opportunity of watching this event. It's at 9 o'clock, they open the doors. So yeah, and it would be full eclipse, I understand, and uh, the blue, black moon, they call it, the red um, viewing of it. It will start around 10 p.m., so you will have a few viewing of it. I'm very excited, and I hope the weather helps so <laughs> we can watch it from the rooftop. They have uh, telescopes and binoculars, so it would be fascinating if we can get up there. And then we have another special event taking place this evening also at Veterans Memorial Park in Bay City at 7 p.m. There is the POWMIA Remembrance Ceremonies. And these ceremonies are being offered in conjunction with the River of Time uh, Living History in Common event. And it, uh, they are part of the many activities that they have scheduled during the weekend. And of course, the Bay County Library System is bringing the nationally renowned children's author, Jonathan Rand, to the State Theater on Thursday, October 8th at 6.30 p.m. for a free admission, no registration required event, and students grades first to six, which is the intended audience of the books from this author, are invited to attend with their families. So please take that into consideration also when planning ahead. And you may find information regarding these and other events offered by your library and other members of the a la carte group by clicking on the What's Next section of the library's website, which is www.baycountylibrary.org. As for today's program, it is indeed my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, as she is someone with whom I used to work at the Sage Branch Library, previous to her retirement from the Bay County Library System. 
Betsy earned her Bachelor of Arts degree from Michigan State University and worked as a teacher, a social worker, a librarian, and she's, <laughs> and she's currently enjoying her retirement by spending time with her grandchildren and taking with her husband, photographing nature, and reading, of course. As we celebrate the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II this year, it is very fitting that the book Betsy selected to review today is When Books Went to War, the stories that help us win World War II with Molly by Molly Capital Money. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Betsy Osborne. Thank you, Esther. I'm very glad to be here today, and um, I want to thank the Book for Lunch Committee for allowing me to do this. And I'm going to have to sit today. My back and I have a conversation every morning, and this morning it said sit, so that's what I'm going to do. I listen to it. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. I also want to thank um, the guys who set up the room today. They um, did some last minute things for me, which I really appreciate. And I want to say, thank Walt, who is our IT person, who put together the PowerPoint presentation for me. So it is going to be a lot of slides, and um, we'll talk about when books went to war via the slides. Now, before we begin, I want to make it clear that I am um, by no means an expert on um, the topics that are going to be mentioned in When Books Went to War. We'll talk about the Victory Book Campaign, We'll talk about the Armed Forces Editions books. If we have time, we'll talk a little bit about the GI Bill. Um, I am also by no means an expert on World War II. I enjoy reading memoirs and human interest stories about that time period, probably because it was my parents' war. And it had an effect on them, and therefore an effect on all of us. So um, if I, I know next to nothing about the politics about the battles, about the dates, any of that. What I enjoy reading is books about the people who lived through that time period, and I consider every one of them a hero. Um, we have no idea what that was like. I can read every memoir, every human interest book there's ever been published, and I still won't know what it was like to live through that time period. This. Um, was made very clear to me a few years ago when I reviewed the book um, by Tom Broca, uh, The Greatest Generation. And I loved that book and I told a lot of stories from that book and we had a good presentation. And at the end there was time for um, discussion and questions. And it was an, an older group and I asked if any of them had any memories of World War II. And one very distinguished elderly man uh, raised his hand and he said the only memory I have of World War II is being afraid we wouldn't win. And those of us who live today and read stories about World War II have the luxury of knowing how it turned out. And um, the people who lived through that were never really sure how it would end. So. Um, we're going to start with the PowerPoint, and I think it was number four that worked the best. I think maybe we need it a little darker in here. Can you see that all right? Oh, it's a delay. Okay, sorry. This is the front cover of When Books Went to War, the stories that helped that helped us win World War II. And it's my, by Molly Guptill Manning. I'm gonna call her Molly because that middle name just throws me every time. Um, the emphasis I wanna make here is that it's the stories that helped win World War II. There were many things that besides the battles and the soldiers and the politics and the government that helped win that war. Things like the rationing and the victory gardens and the collecting scrap and collecting metal and collecting paper, collecting bacon grease. The home front worked very, very hard to help win that war. And one of the things that they did was they sent books to soldiers. 
They decided, the government knew, the army knew, librarians knew, and people who loved books knew that if the soldiers had something to read, it would help them get through the terrible days that they had to endure. It all started, the story of when books went to war started on May 10th, 1933. Does anybody know what that date was? It was the day that um, in the city of Berlin, they held a rally in one of the town squares. It was uh, put on by a number of university students thousands of university students who had planned this rally for many, many weeks. It was attended by about 40,000 um, German citizens who heard in advance that this rally was going to occur and um, were very eager to be there. There was a parade route leading up to that rally and another 40,000 German citizens, Berlin citizens, lined that parade route. The parade route um, was there for a number of vehicles, some uh, limousines, some large trucks, some cars, most of them black, who drove up to the uh, plaza in Berlin, pulled into the plaza one by one, and they were met by a line of students. The first student stood at the car, the last student stood in the center of the plaza. They opened the doors of the cars and the students took out books and they handed them down the line of students in Berlin, and the last person in line threw them into the fire. That was the first day of the, the books burnings in Berlin. This is what it looked like. The Germans were very, very um, outspoken about burning books. They burned any books that they thought um, was in any way anti-German. They kept only books that they felt supported the Nazi philosophy. Although the students led this rally, it was um, underwritten or supported by the Nazi party, and a member of the Nazi party did speak at that rally. Of course, people in the free world were aghast at this, uh, especially librarians and book lovers and people at universities. And um, the news made it to the United States, and the librarians, and people who love books, the publishers, authors, realized what a horrible, horrible thing this was, and uh, were very, very unhappy about this. They burned books by Helen Keller. They burned books by Upton Sinclair, um, H.G. Wells. Um, some of the famous German authors, Thomas Mann, um, Heinrich Hein, um, anything, medical books, anything that they felt was anti-German. To say nothing of the Bible. You are right there. Now, I went to the Bay City Times to see um, if they covered the story, and they did. This was the um, paper that came out the day of the book burnings, they knew that the books were going to be burned. The Germans announced this in advance. And the headline is Blacklisted Books to Burn in Berlin. Nazi students gather on German publications. Part of it reads, blacklisted books from private as well as public libraries were piled high today throughout Germany for public burning tonight. Schoolboys enthusiastically rushed final preparations for the huge bonfires. Nazi student committees of action have been working at top speed for more than a week, arranging for the great purging of the libraries of un-German influences. Now that was on about page four of the front section. And being a book lover, I was very disappointed. I thought it should be the headline, but it wasn't. The day the Next day, there was also an article. Again, I thought the front page should say books burn in Berlin. But it was uh, again on about the third or fourth page. Again, they just said, um, only the ashes remain today of thousands of books by Germans and foreign authors, Americans included, which burned on the fires throughout the co country last night. The works of such Americans as Jack London, 
Helen Keller were among the literature condemned as contrary to the new German spirit and heaped on the fires by the cartload by the students. And one of the uh, Nazi uh, officials who spoke there said, the period of Jewish intellectualism now has ended. As I said, I was a little disappointed in the articles, but this was a hard time in the United States. It was 1939. There were a lot of other things going on in Bay City. They recognized the, big bur the book burnings, but not very many people realized uh, what it would mean, what it was the beginning of. However, uh, one of the books that burned was written by a German man. Um, many of his works were burned, Henrik Hein, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right. It's H-E-I-N-E. -E. He was a German writer in the 1800s, and he had written in one of his books in 1823, wherever they burn books, they will also, in the end, burn human beings. So Henrik knew how important this was. The years passed. The Germans um, continued to burn books, among other things. They, per they persecuted the Jews. They took over much of Europe, a little bit at a time, um, primarily using not only aggression, but um, propaganda and uh, intimidation. The United States in 1940, in September of 1940, realized that they may be drawn into the war and they, they instituted uh, the draft. And they were of course concerned about how the American people would feel about the draft. And they were nervous um, on the first day that registration for the draft was to begin. But they needn't have worried. The American men and American people were ready to sign up for the draft and knew that they would probably be involved in the conflict in Europe. In New York City, 991,000 men uh, registered on the very first day. Um, they had to make two arrests. The first one occurred because two of the men got in a fight about who was next in line. <laughs> And the second one occurred because one of the men decided that he needed to prepare for registration by spending the day at the bar. <laughs> and uh, so they had to take him away. <clears throat> Unfortunately, um, Congress passed the draft and people started to register for the draft before they passed a bill um, to procure the money to build new um, training camps and to update the training camps that existed. They were intended to build 46 new facilities, but um, <clears throat> the money didn't come in for about six months after the draft was instituted. So many soldiers who reported to camp found um, camps that were not ready to train them, or they found camps that they had to build. A lot of the soldiers built their own training camps and then trained. They trained for guns. Um, uh, for weapons using broomsticks. Um, they would have jeeps that were, would have big signs on them that would say tank, and uh, that's how they did some of their initial training. The librarians in the area, since the camp libraries were non-existent or had disappeared, um, conducted local book drives. They knew that the men would have very little uh, means of entertainment. They would train all day or build all day and then have nothing to do on their free time. So they had local book drives to provide the soldiers with books. Of course, in December 1941 was Pearl Harbor. <clears throat> we declared war on Japan. Immediately after that, Germany declared war on us. And so we were off and running. Um, another thing that occurred at that time in 1942 was the ninth anniversary of the book burning in Berlin. That had happened in 1933. And the <clears throat> librarians and the American Library Association and publishers and authors um, felt that it would be important to commemorate that day. And I thought, well, that's about the silliest thing in the world. Why would you want to do that? But they wanted to bring to the um, forefront of the American public how important books and learning and freedom of thought 
were in the Second World War. It wasn't just a war of aggression, it was a war of ideas. And they wanted the American public to be sure that they um, were aware of that. One of the things that <coughs> happened during that um, commemoration was uh, Stephen Vincent Benet wrote a play that was, um, I lost my cards, that was broadcast on NBC radio on May 11th, 1942. They first broadcast it rather late at night because they weren't quite sure how the public would take it. It was so popular that they rebroadcast it again and again and again, and they finally put it into book form. And uh, my husband Jack and I are going to read just part of this play. Ladies in the back, don't jump when he speaks because his, his uh, role is as a Nazi voice. Um, I'm starting here where the narrator is just listing books. French history for secondary schools, history of France, history of France in Europe, contemporary Europe, legends and fables of France for children. Suppress, withdraw, all those books are on the blacklist. But these are not guns or daggers stored up against revolt. They're commonplace textbooks, thumbed by thousands of schoolboys' fingers, ink-spotted, dog-eared, drowsed above in, in classrooms, familiar and dull and mild. They must be harmless enough. They are not harmless. We know what we're doing. Yes, they know what they are doing. They know if you take the children of a country and teach them nothing but lies about the world, give them no chance for argument or questions, give them no books that show another side, no word of all the books that speak for freedom, the man who grows from the child will believe the lies and never hear of the truth. It's a simple plan, as simple and efficient as arsenic. Just rewrite all the books to suit yourself and the rest will follow in time, the beatings and the burnings. I gotta remember to turn my card and hit the button at the same time. This is the, um, they burn the books, the title page of that. The Victory Book Campaign <clears throat> started about this time as well. They, the librarians and publishers and so forth realized that they were not be able to collect enough books on the local level, so they went to the government and they asked for funding for a um, national victory book campaign. Um, <clears throat> these posters on the wall are all um, reproductions of the posters that were put out for the book campaign. We're losing one. Um, as I said, they're all reproductions. If I could find an original, I would just be ecstatic. Um, these are from the 43. The Victory Book Campaign went on in 1942 and 1943. And they say, give more good books to our men in the armed services. Send all you can to your local library or collection center. If they practically plead for books. Give your good books to our fighting men. The books you like to keep are the good ones to give. Now we'll talk about the other two later. The Victory Book Campaign was very successful. They um, headed it with a female librarian out of Los Angeles who gave up her job for four months. She did wonderful work with publicity. Um, the books were um, popular, or the book giving was popular. The problem was they got a lot of books that they didn't need. This was, and they discovered this in 1942, so in 1943 they put out the Victory Book Campaign Manual for state and local directors. I was fortunate enough to see this at the um, Hoyt Library in Saginaw. Um, the librarian there got it out of storage for me and allowed me to read it. It was just really interesting. Um, there was a question and answer. Um, part of it, and a uh, library um, sent in a question. They whined a little bit. They said, we're really busy. We don't have a lot of staff. We've had to cut back. It's difficult to find volunteers to help us collect and sort through these books. 
And the answer um, very simply said, too bad. We expect you to um, collect the books. We expect you to sort them. Only good books were sent. They couldn't be dirty. They couldn't be dog-eared or written in. Um, they needed to have a, a frequent or a recent um, publication date. If there were technical books, they were not to be sent unless they were um, up to date. Um, there could be no books that were um, too feminine. They didn't want cookbooks. They didn't want beauty books. But you would be amazed how many people actually sent in these types of books. And so the librarians were um, expected to sort them. It's wartime, and they sorted those books, and they sent the good ones to the army. Um, if there were children's books, they gave them to um, places that needed children's books, like orphanages. If there were rare books, any book that they deemed to be worth over $10, they were to set aside and sell the book and then put the money towards the Victory Book Campaign. Um, the books that they couldn't give away or use went to the scrap, to the paper scrap. So the librarians were not just sorting the books, they were distributing them, they were making sure that they got to the right places. This is the opening day of the Victory Book Campaign in Bay City. Um, this again was not front page, I thought it should be, but it wasn't. It was page four, they had other things to talk about like the battles. Um, the Victory Book Campaign in Bay City opens today. Local residents are asked by Miss Isabel A. Ballou, head of the public library, and Miss Molly Gilbert, sage librarian, to check their bookshelves for volumes of interest for our boys in the service. They point out this is an important <clears throat> effort in maintaining the morale of American soldiers and sailors. Now, they had a couple of other articles. We'll get to those as we go along. This, again, was um, published, was put out, excuse me, was provided by the public libraries of Saginaw. I asked um, our reference librarians if they had any signs from that period, and they did not. I'm thinking most of the librarians didn't feel that these posters and signs would ever be of any worth to anybody, and they probably just um, contributed them to the um, paper campaign. This was a homemade sign from Saginaw Public. Books for our soldiers and sailors, leave them here or take them to the public library. So this sign could have been in a grocery store, a drug store, a school. They had book collection points all over. And um, the library was in charge of taking care of all those books. The government expected them to send at least 50 books a week. This was another one from, from Saginaw. Let your idle books help our soldiers. You can do your bit by immediately bringing good books to the public library on the east side or Butman Fish on the west side to be forwarded to army camps, the front, and hospitals. This was how New York conducted their victory book campaign. They had huge rallies and collection um, uh, collection rallies, and um, famous people would come and speak. Kate Smith was one of them. Um, actors, singers would come and encourage people to, dis to contribute their books. This is another um, poster, Give More Books for the Victory Book Campaign. All the posters I found were from 1943. 1942, they must not have gotten any, gotten off the ground enough. Uh, this was another article from the Bay City Times. Um, they list the type of books that they want collected and anything. They wanted anything. Um, biographies, technical books, um, fiction, funny books. They liked historical fiction, westerns, uh, mysteries just any variety of books. And this article, it doesn't show there later on, says, the books will be sent not only to camps, forts, and stations, but also to ships, outposts, service, and recreation centers, in fact, any official military location. 
Now this is where um, the Victory Book Campaign started to get into trouble. Um, a lot of the books donated were hardcover. And as you notice with the one poster where the man is carrying all the books, I believe that poster really was from World War I. They had a book campaign then too, but it wasn't as uh, large. He's carrying all these hardcover books and they realized that the soldiers couldn't do that. They, they, if they were going into battle, they didn't have room in their knapsack for a book that large. They were heavy. They would have to be discarded. So the Victory Book Campaign was not providing the types of books that they really needed. This is another um, sign from the Public Libraries of Saginaw. This was handmade. Um, remember when we used to have to make signs and we'd make a ruler line and then we'd have the stencils and we'd line them all up and we'd trace all those. <clears throat> and mine were always crooked. I just, I could not do that. And then you draw each letter in. That's how this sign was made. And I'm very thankful to the um, Leo and the Public Libraries of Saginaw for letting me look at these things. The book campaign in Bay City was deemed successful. Um, this article tells a few of the stories of the people who donated books. Um, one man wrote under one of the signs, V for victory. I can't be with you fellows, but I and everyone else are doing all we can to help. Hope you enjoy this book. It's good. Another man um, was um, classified 4F due to his eyesight, and he collected books in an effort to do something for the Great Victory Drive, of which the book campaign was a part. They were collected to sustain the morale of the armed forces. Although he has brought in, um, he brought in one um, automobile load of books one day and the next day he brought in another one. He wanted to help because he couldn't be there. Another man stopped the librarians on the street. I don't know what they were doing, probably putting up signs. Took them in the house and he had a whole bookshelf full of um, westerns, Zane Grey novels, and he donated all of those books to the Victory Book Campaign. As I said, the um, campaign was in trouble because of the types of books that were being collected. It only lasted um, for two years. And then they went on to another idea. Um, in St. Louis, they advertised the Victory Book campaign on the um, streetcar and bus tickets. Victory Book campaign, Give Books New or Old, listed the collection sites. Um, they also had a postmark um, that, that said, give to the Victory Book Campaign. The um, public relations for this was awesome. They really um, did a lot to promote the um, Victory Book Campaign. We're going to diverge, ooh, I'm running out of time, for just a minute and talk about pocket paper books. At this time, also, um, pocket books developed the first paperback. Up until then, most books were hardcover. They couldn't do as much publishing as they wanted because of the paper and cloth restrictions by the government. So pocket books um, developed the first paperbacks. This is a genuine pocket book. Inside, it said it's a wartime book, and it complies with all restrictions on um, paper and other materials. And it says uh, books are weapons in the war on ideas. This is the back of a paperback book that was published at that time. In the bottom corner it says, send this book to a boy, not a man, a boy in the armed services anywhere in the United States for only three cents. So Pocketbook encouraged people to send these books um, to the soldiers. Share this book with someone in uniform in the bottom corner. In a pocket book, they also had an advertisement for buy war bonds and a, a little bit about don't waste anything. You can help by saving useful um, waste and scrap. They're, they're doing everything they can to support the war effort. This is another one. This one is a little more emotional. Talks about it's only a piece of paper. 
but it could be part of an airborne container um, that they use to transport medicine. It could be the band on the shell case or the bomb that ends the war. It could be made into the map that points the way for soldiers to, um, to uh, be where they're supposed to be. So they're pleading with people to uh, donate paper. This is the page in the pocket books that I was hoping I was find, would find, and Jack found it in a booth at the Bay City uh, Antique Mall. They actually published the address for the Army and the Navy. They put it in the back of their paperbacks so that, and encouraged the reader of the book to, when he was finished, mail it to one of those addresses and have it distributed to the soldiers. <clears throat> As we go on, um, during the same time period, while the Victory Book campaign was going on and the pocket books were developed, a group of um, librarians and publishers and printers and authors formed the Council on Books in Wartime. And they decided that they needed to do something to help with the war effort. And they knew, as did the government and a lot of people, that this was a war on ideas and that the soldiers needed books. They thought the best way that they, as book people, could support the soldiers was to give them books. So they had books to read while they were fighting in Germany in the place that banned books. And a number of the books that were published and given to the soldiers were actually banned in Germany. So the Council on Books in Wartime formed a group called the Editions for the Armed Forces Incorporated. It was a non-public, or excuse me, non-profit book. And they um, put together what they called the Armed Forces Editions. They called them ASEs. Um, when Books Went to War has a list of all the books that were ever made into ASEs in the back. They were numbered. The first book was A1, and it was published in September of 1941, I think. Um, from the time of conception of this idea until the time the first books were sent to the soldiers was seven months. The um, man who ran it had, run, had worked for Pocket Books, who put out those paperbacks. And he knew what he was doing. He had to work with his boss, who was the Council on Books in Wartime. He had to work with um, the people who were chosen to read the books. They had a committee of people whose job it was to read books. They got a list from publishers who had lists of books that they had on their shelves and lists of books that were going to be published. Um, the book, bookstore people, um, narrowed down the list, gave the list to the readers. The readers read every book to make sure it was fit to be read by the soldiers. Now, they didn't censor books. That was not what they had in mind. But they needed to be careful of a number of things. They needed to be sure that um, the book did not offend their allies. They needed to be sure that the book did not offend any um, racial or um, religious group in the United States. Um, they need to be sure that the book did not, was not derogatory against democracy. Those were the things that they censored for. They read every book, and they sent their choices um, to their boss, and the boss sent them to the Army and Navy. They had to okay them. And then the books had to be published in the smaller size. They had to be um, typeset. They, we had no scanning in any of that. Any book, every book was individually typeset. This is the cover of a typical ASE books. The ASE books were small. They were this size and this size. And these sizes were unusual for books, but they were made this way because they measured the soldiers' pockets. This one would fit in their pants pocket. This one would fit in their shirt pocket. <clears throat> um, every book had a number, which indicated what number book it was. It was. They printed 1,322 books. 
It had, of course, the title, the subtitle, the author. It had a snapshot of the cover of the original book. And then it had the Armed Forces Edition label, and then they had a statement about whether it was complete or condensed. A lot of people, because they were small, thought they were condensed. They did not condense any book unless they had to because of paging. And if they did that, they condensed it um, like they would condense any book. They did not remove content. They did not censor by condensing. They had either the author or an editor condense it. This is another one um, that was, says it was condensed for wartime reading. Um, they condensed about 75 of the 1,300 books. Um, this I wanted to show you. I keep hitting the clock. Um, because of the number in the corner, that little number, J22 or whatever, mm -hmm. um, that would coincide with the number on the front of the book. Now, a couple of the books that I have that were published early did not have that number, and apparently there was a problem matching up the book to the covers, so they put a number on the inside of the book. The um, covers were published, were printed at one place, the books were printed at another, and had to match them up. Each one had a little blurb about the armed service editions, that they were meant for the soldiers only, that they were put out by the um, editions for books in wartime, and they were not to be sold. They were um, purposely made to only withstand about six readings because they did not want free books to um, flood the European market after the war. Now, the soldiers made it possible to read them much, much longer. They read them longer than six, six readings because they loved them. Um, that previous page, that previous page listed all the books in that series. Um, they would put out a series of books every month. Every month from the time they started, they put out 30 to 50 titles and 50,000 to 155,000 copies of each title. And they did that every month, and they never missed. The books were printed in the double columns. They studied very carefully how to do the spacing and the type that would be the easiest for the soldiers to read in dimly lit areas. The back of the book would have um, something about what the book was about and that it was a special edition of that book created just for books in wartime. Some of the books had a little bit about um, the author. And this was very interesting. The books were printed two up. So they, would, they used bigger paper, so there would be a book here and a book here. And they had to count words and characters so that the books would be approximately the same size and they wouldn't waste any paper. If one book was shorter than the other book and there were blank pages in the end, then they inserted about the author because they did not want to waste any paper. Now, the books were read for many reasons, um, for entertainment, for just escape, to learn things, um, to learn about themselves, to learn about others, but apparently they were also used to send, me send messages. Now, I have no idea who K9FAE might be, but he was to meet somebody on 10 MTRS. So I hope they got together. <laughs> After Victory in Japan Day, the books went back to the um, original paperback-looking size. They still had all the characteristics of the original ASEs, um, the number, the thing that said Armed Forces Edition, everything. On the inside, I was so excited when I found this book because this book was one of the last series of ASE books to be printed. God, I'm running out of time. <laughs> um, and it says, with this group of titles listed on the inside back cover, additions for the Armed Services Incorporated, a nonprofit organization established by the Council on Books in Wartime, will terminate its program. 
Since October 1943, when the first series was issued, 1,324, I missed that, titles have been published in a total of 122,923,388 books have been distributed to Army and Navy personnel overseas. So that was their goodbye message. <clears throat> we all know what D-Day was. President Eisenhower, bless his heart, was a reader, or he wasn't president at the time, he was colonel or general or whoever, <clears throat> was a reader and he liked to read westerns. And he knew as they planned D-Day that the men were more than apt to be stuck on ships um, before they actually landed on the coast of France. So he made sure he stockpiled ASE books. And he made sure that when those soldiers got on the ships for D-Day, there was one book for every soldier. Um, this is a World War soldier, World War II soldier, who was on Omaha Beach, Red Sector, on D-Day as a medic. He happens to be my dad. Um, he was 4F for most of the war. He had a heart murmur. Uh, when he went to register, when he was 35 years old, they took him. Um, as my mother always said, they were taking cannon fodder for D-Day. Um, but he says, we read. We read all day. And he says, I don't know where the books come, came from, but the um, Red Cross has a lot of them. And so my dad read some of these ASE books while he was preparing to land on Omaha Beach. Now I want to talk about the books, and this is, I hope we can get through it. The soldiers read in the chow lines. They read while they were waiting for a movie to start. They read while they were guarding a plane. They read everywhere that they could find a place to read. Westerns were their favorites. Um, Zane Gray and one of the other Western authors had the most titles published by the ASE books. Um, they each had 18 titles published. Um, they liked books about where they were fighting. This was a book about North Africa. I put this in here because um, the Council on Books and Wartime got a complaint about this book. Um, a soldier wrote, was very angry because they talked about when England first um, went into North Africa and made it a colony. Um, and uh, he felt that that was treated in too positive a light, that it was too similar to what was going on in Europe, and he didn't think that this was a good book to give to the soldiers. Yeah. Um, when they got letters of complaint, um, they answered every letter. They would get letters of complaint because the books would be um, put together wrong. They might find a page with Ten blank, a book with ten blank pages, or a book that would have inserted some pages from another book. If those soldiers wrote to the Council on Books and Warfare and complained, they received a letter of apology and a copy of the book and, um, that was in good shape and not a problem. They read in the hospital. They read everywhere. Um, Ernie Pyle was one of the, sold, the um, books that um, was, pub was published in ASE editions. Ernie Pyle, of course, was a columnist. Um, he wrote um, columns about the war. He actually served with the soldiers. And he, I'm, I lost my cards. I'm all out of order. <laughs> he served on, um, in Europe. He was in on the liberation of France. He um, then, when the war was over, he went to um, North Africa. Or excuse me, not when the war was over. He went to North Africa. When the war in Europe was over, he went to the South Pacific and served there. And he sent columns back, columns and columns, about uh, the soldiers and what they were doing. And he always used the soldier's name and where they were from. Unfortunately, Ernie Pyle was killed by a sniper um, in the Battle of Okinawa. And one of his books was the very last book to be um, put out by the um, ASE editions. 
and I thought that was very fitting. I want to read a couple of um, sections from his book. Um, and like I said, he named the soldiers. Warrant Officer Luke Corrigan of 816 Hemlock Street, Scanton, Pennsylvania, had a tough experience. It happened that a large bunch, bunch of American nurses were headed for the front and had to be outfitted in short order. Mr. Corrigan was in charge of one of the Army's big warehouses, so it was his job to outfit the nurses. But Army warehouses, it turned out, didn't carry such things as slips, step-ins, brassieres, and whatnot. So Mr. Corrigan had to get himself an interpreter and go blushing all over the city, buying up dozens of those feminine items. He completed his mission and dashed to the train just before departure time. One nurse saw that he had and grabbed what he had and grabbed at a box. Then others grabbed. The boxes flew open, and the first thing Mr. Corrigan knew, he looked like a Christmas tree, very much bedecked with panties, undies, and other pink unmentionables. <laughs> Mr. Corrigan was very ill at ease. <laughs> and then this is another one that he wrote of a little um, more serious nature. A fighter pilot I knew, a squadron leader, sent close to 200 Germans to their doom. He was home homeward bound from a mission and flying right on the deck, in other words, just above the ground. He zoomed over a little rise, and there straight ahead, dead in his sights, was the evening chow line behind a German truck. It all happened in a second. There wasn't time for the Germans to duck. The pilot simply pressed the button, cannon shells streamed forth, and Germans and pieces of Germans flew in all directions. The squadron leader barely mentioned it in his report when he got back. He said it, was all, it almost made him sick. Killing was his business, but it was killing an opponent in the air that he liked. I'm not even going to mention his name because he felt so badly about it. Now, this book was one of the books that the soldiers um, had access to through Armed Sor Services Editions. They read in close quarters. High Time was a comedy that was very popular. Um, my mother enjoyed these books. She read them. This is part of a series by Mary Laswell. The Tall Woman is Miss Tinkham. Um, the Woman Here with the Ideas is Mrs. Feely. And the Woman Here with the Beer is Mrs. Rasmussen. Um, they all live together in Mrs. Feely's house. Mrs. Rasmussen is a, a very good cook, but she cooks one-handed with a beer in the other hand. <laughs> Miss Tinkham is very much a lady, um, and they decide that they have not done enough for the war effort. So um, they all go and try and um, get a job at the munitions plant, but of course they won't take them because they're too old. So they do a number of other things, including feeding the men who are working um, in the munitions plant who had to come in from an art living in their hometown, will only have apartments, and they um, feed them every night. And it ends up becoming a, a club for all these men. So that's a, a humorous <coughs> book that they read. Valley of the Sky was actually written by a man who um, served in the South Pacific. I couldn't find out for sure if he wrote it while he was serving, but it's about a um, bomber that uh, flies over the, the South Pacific on a mission. And it, it, was t it was reviewed as being a very positive book, although it was difficult for me to read because you know you get to meet all these men who are part of the um, crew on this bomber and you know bad things are going to happen to them, which they do. But they considered this a book that was positive because it helped the soldiers know that um, they had something good to go home to and that it was difficult for soldiers who had seen the horrible things they'd seen in the Second World War to go home and adjust. We all know that. And they saw this book as a very positive book telling those soldiers that yes, they could go home and everything would be all right. Our Hearts Were Young and Gay is one that um, just broke my heart. It's a comedy book. Um, oh, let's see if I 
like I said, I'm not with my cards, so I can't find my numbers here. Um, that was um, read by a young man. And I want to read this part. The morning after a particularly trying night of heavy enemy mortar fire, I was walking along the road when I saw some of the dead being loaded gently onto the backs of several trucks. This was a letter that um, this author had access to. Which had brought, the trucks had been drawn up to take their bodies to the division cemetery. I looked to see if I recognized any of the dead Marines. There were half a dozen stretched out, some on their backs, and several face down. One of the latter was a young, fair-haired private who had only recently arrived as a replacement, full of exuberance at finally being a full-fledged Marine on the battlefront. As I looked down at him, I saw something which I don't think I shall ever forget. Sticking from his back trouser pocket was a yellow pocket edition of the book he had evidently been reading in his spare moments. Only the title was visible. Our hearts were young and gay. Um, this is a comedy about two ladies, young ladies, who go on their first trip to Europe. It, they're kind of like uh, Lucille Ball and Ethel. And they get into all kinds of crazy predicaments. And this is where they bought fur coats. Um, white fur was the, all the rage that year. And so they bought them in this tent style. And they paraded all around Paris in these coats. And I only hope that young soldier was able to get to that part before he was killed because it was, it was very funny. And I can see a young man enjoying that book. Um, the sailor was, was said to be reading a Western romance. They sent short stories to um, the, the soldiers. This was the O. Henry. Um, short stories, were, which were very honored short stories. This particular book happened to have a dedication to Stephen Vincent Benet, who was the man who had written the, the play, They Burned the Book. They called him a, a good poet, a good short story writer, and a good American. Strange Fruit was a book that was banned um, in many places in the United States. It's a story about a, a biracial love affair that results in a pregnancy. Forever Amber was also, um, do you remember that? <laughs> it was a bestseller. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt read Strange Fruit. She did not read this one. Um, this is more of one of our first bodice busters. It had over 900 pages, and it uh, had to be condensed. There were other titles that were banned. Um, the Council on Books in Warfare, in wartime, refused to um, not send these books to the soldiers. The soldiers wanted books about romance, and they wanted sexual um, scenes in the books. So they said, what the guys want, they're going to get. A Tree Grows in Brooklyn was one of the most, most favored books. Um, they loved, the soldiers loved that book because it reminded them of home. This was the first book to be reprinted. A number of books were printed more than once, and this was the first one that that happened to. Um, Betty Smith received many poignant letters from soldiers, and she answered every one. Chicken Every Sunday is another um, comedy about um, a young girl whose mother runs a boarding house. And the soldiers love this book because of the descriptions of her mother cooking dinner for the people in the boarding house. We're almost done. Um, the Great Gatsby was sent to the men overseas. As some of you may know, The Great Gatsby, when it was first published, did not go over well. Um, it sold very few copies. F. Scott Fitzgerald died thinking that it was a failure. They sent this book to um, the soldiers, and the soldiers liked it so much that they wrote home, told their family about it, and um, the, the ASC editions of Great Gatsby are credited with make, helping to make it the classic that it is today. Um, they sent cartoons to the book, to the soldiers. 
This is my favorite one. This is a gentleman in the South Pacific who has rigged up his cot on stilts. He's got a box he's using for a pillow, and he's enjoying a good book. <laughs> um, that's all I have about the, the books. Um, this is a composite of the pictures that I was able to get of the books, of the men reading books. It turned out that we put out more ASE books and sent them to soldiers both in Europe and in the South Pacific than Hitler was able to destroy during World War II. So um, we won the war on books. Um, we won it at a great cost, we all know. But um, the books played a, a wonderful role in helping the soldiers to escape and to remember home and to get through that war. Now, I had a screen about the GI Bill because I want to mention that really quickly. The government, as the war was drawing to an end, realized that because of the ASE books, they had soldiers that were better read and better educated than they'd ever had before. Men who had never read, who were bored, would pick up a book and read. It would be Plato or Socrates or anything. And they had all these men coming back who were not going to be happy settling into some of the blue collar jobs that they left. Now there are, of course, a whole other reasons why the GI Bill was instituted, but they do um, credit the ASC books with being part of the reason that the government passed the GI Bill, which allowed thousands and thousands of American soldiers to go to school, among other things. So that's what I have. Do you have any questions or comments? I hope you enjoyed it. Um, this book is wonderful. Um, it explains the ASC books and the Victory Book campaign very well. It also, in the back, has a list, this is wonderful, of every book every, ever published in ASC edition. I'm having a great time finding books that I want to read um, from this time period. It's fun to know what the soldiers were reading. One was called um, The Minor Takes a Wife. And I'm hoping I can find that one. I haven't found it yet. You have a question? Uh, yes, I just wanted to mention, just for knowledge, when you were in one of the slides back a ways where you had said it was um, K-9 um, and some numbers and there are some letters and then it said to 10 MTRS. Well, actually, that is a amateur radio or ham radio call sign, a federal call sign. Is it? Because I'm a ham radio operator. Oh. And back in the day, they used to have, um, and they may still, they're called Mars stations, where soldiers can go, or servicemen can go to this area, and if they have a license, they can operate these ham radio uh, uh, stations and then talk to people throughout the world. The 10 MTRS stands for 10 meters, which is one of a multi amount of bands or frequencies that you can talk to on a radio and you can talk all over the world on that particular uh, band and so that's probably why um, that they message did that. and the nine that's denoted on that k9 whatever mm -hmm. denotes the state or maybe a number a couple states where that person lives or got his license at. So huh, well that solves the mystery. Oh, wow. Now I know. Great, thank you. Yes? When books went to war, and the subtitle is the stories that helped us win World War II. Thank you. Oh, um, I was able to find a lady at the Saginaw um, Antique Mall whose <clears throat> boyfriend <clears throat> had a number of the ASE books. Oh. And <clears throat> I purchased the ones that I wanted from her. She's selling them for $5 a piece. If anybody is interested, there's a couple of um, John Steinbeck in there. There's a couple of Westerns. There's one called Mankind So Far. I don't know what that's about. Um, but if you're interested, I have both the larger size and the smaller size. And um, you're welcome to come up and look through them. Just um, be careful with them because they, the inside paper is very delicate. They won't handle a sticky note. I know that. Yes? Did you ever talk to any man who read one of those books? I did not. The man that I thought might um, 
did not remember them. And my father never mentioned them. And I think that that was one of the purposes that they fulfilled. They were just there. And they read them, and they got them through. And it's not something that all of the soldiers remembered. Some of the soldiers did, but not all of them. And I think that would be what it was like with my dad, because my dad wasn't a reader. I'm sure he just used it to pass the time. Yes? What does ASE um, armed Service Edition. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all for coming.